Well, this next talk is uh, the 45th chapter. This is the 45th talk in this collection, and it's called Dhamma Fighting. <laughs> <laughs> and this was first published in Food for the Heart, and this was a, a talk given to monks and novices at Wat Papong. So this is um, a, uh, one of those talks probably given immediately after the recitation of the monastic rules. So uh, this is... Uh, not one of the, the talks that he would have given for the lay community or, or in, in, a, in a more sort of informal gathering under his kuti, but it would be more like after the, the fortnightly recitation of the rules. So uh, as we've, we've had one or two others of these before, so it, it gets into, usually gets into some serious nitty-gritty <laughs> of monastic training. Um, so this is Dhamma fighting. Fight greed, fight aversion, fight delusion. <laughs> These are the enemy. In the practice of Buddhism, the path of the Buddha, we fight with Dhamma, using patient endurance. We fight by resisting our countless moods. Dhamma and the world are interrelated. Where there is Dhamma, there is the world. Where there is the world, there is Dhamma. Where there are defilements, there are those who conquer the defilements, who do battle with them. This is called fighting inwardly. To fight outwardly, people take hold of bombs and guns to throw and shoot. They conquer and are conquered. Conquering others is the way of the world. In the practice of Dhamma, we don't have to fight others, but instead conquer our own minds, patiently enduring and resisting all our moods. When it comes to Dhamma practice, we don't harbor resentment and enmity amongst ourselves, but instead let go of all forms of ill will in our own actions and thoughts, freeing ourselves from jealousy, aversion and resentment. Hatred can only be overcome by not harboring resentment and bearing grudges. Hurtful actions and reprisals are different but closely related. Actions once done are finished with. There is no need to answer with revenge and hostility. This is called action, kamma. Reprisal, vera, means to continue that action further with thoughts of you did it to me and so I'm going to get you back. There's no end to this. It brings about the continual seeking of revenge and so hatred is never abandoned. As long as we behave like this, the chain remains unbroken. There's no end to it. No matter where we go, the feuding continues. The Supreme Teacher taught the world. He had compassion for all worldly beings. But the world nevertheless goes on like this. The wise should look into this and select those things which are of true value. The Buddha had trained in the various arts of warfare as a prince, but he saw that they weren't really useful. They are limited to the world with its fighting and, its, and aggression. Therefore, we who have left the world need to train ourselves. We must learn to give up all forms of evil, giving up those things which are the cause for enmity. We conquer ourselves. We don't try to conquer others. We fight, but we fight only the defilements. If there's greed, we fight that. If there's aversion, we fight that. If there's delusion, we strive to give it up. This is called Dhamma fighting. This warfare of the heart is really difficult. In fact, it's the most difficult thing of all. We become monks in order to contemplate this, to learn the art of fighting greed, aversion and delusion. This is our prime responsibility. This is the inner battle, fighting with defilements. But there are very few people who fight like this. Most people fight with other things. They rarely fight defilements. They rarely even see them. The Buddha taught us to give up all forms of evil and to cultivate virtue. This is the right path. Teaching in this way is like the Buddha picking us up and placing us at the beginning of the path. Having reached the path, whether we walk along it or not, is up to us. The Buddha's job is finished right there. He shows the way, that which is right and that which is not right. This much is enough. The rest is up to us. Now, having reached the path, we still don't know anything. We still haven't seen anything. So we must learn. To learn, we must be prepared to endure some hardship. Just like students in the world. It's difficult enough to obtain the knowledge and learning ne necessary for them to p pursue their careers. They have to endure. When they think wrongly or feel averse or lazy, they must force themselves to continue before they can graduate and get a job. The practice for a monk is similar. If we determine to practice and contemplate, then we will surely see the way. Ditti mana is a harmful thing. Ditti means view or opinion. All forms of view are called ditti. Seeing good as evil, seeing evil as good, any way whatsoever that we see these things. This is not the problem. The problem lies with clinging to those views, called mana. 
holding on to those views as if they were the truth. This leads us to spin around from birth to death, never reaching completion, just because of that clinging. So the Buddha urged us to let go of views. If many people live together, as we do here, they can still practice comfortably if their views are in harmony. But even two or three monks would have difficulty living together if their views were not good or harmonious. When we humble ourselves and let go of our views, even if there are many of us, we come together at the place of the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. It's not true to say that there will be disharmony just because there are many of us. Just look at a millipede. A millipede has many legs, doesn't it? Just looking at it, you think that it would have difficulty walking, but actually it doesn't. It has its own order and rhythm. In our practice, it's the same. If we practice as the noble sangha of the Buddha practiced, then it's easy. That is, supatipanno, those who have practiced well, ujjupatipanno, those who practice straightly, nyaya patipanno, those who practice to transcend suffering, and samichi patipanno, those who practice properly. These four qualities established within us will make us true members of the Sangha. Even if we number in the hundreds or thousands, no matter how many we are, we all travel the same path. We come from different backgrounds, but we're the same. Even though our views may differ, if we practice correctly, there'll be no friction. Just like all the rivers and streams which flow to the sea, once they enter the sea, they all have the same taste and color. It's the same with people. When they enter the stream of Dhamma, it's the one Dhamma. Even though they come from different places, they harmonize, they merge. But the, but the thinking which causes all the disputes and conflict is ditti mana. Therefore, the, the Buddha taught us to let go of views. Don't allow mana to cling to those views beyond their relevance. The Buddha taught the value of constant sati, recollection. Whether we're standing, walking, sitting or reclining, wherever we are, we should have this power of recollection. When we have sati, we see ourselves, we see our own minds. We see the body within the body, the mind within the mind. If we don't have sati, we don't know anything. We aren't aware of what's happening. So, sati is very important. With constant sati, we will listen to the Dhamma of the Buddha at all times. This is because eye seeing forms is Dhamma. Ear hearing sounds is Dhamma. Nose smelling odors is Dhamma. Tongue tasting flavors is Dhamma. Body feeling sensations is Dhamma. When impressions arise in the mind, that is Dhamma also. Therefore, one who has constant sati always hears the Buddha's teaching. The Dhamma is always there. Why? Because of sati, because we are aware. <coughs> sati is recollection, sampajanya is self-awareness. This awareness is the actual buddho, the Buddha. When there is sati sampajanya, understanding will follow. We know what's going on. When the eye sees forms, is this proper or improper? When the ear hears sound, is this appropriate or inappropriate? Is it harmful? Is it wrong? Is it right? And so on, like this with everything. If we understand, we hear the Dhamma all the time. So, let us all understand that right now, we're learning in the midst of Dhamma. Whether we go forward or step back, we meet the Dhamma. It's all Dhamma if we have sati. Even seeing the animals running around in the forest, we can reflect. Seeing that all animals are the same as us. They run away from suffering and chase after happiness, just as people do. Whatever they don't like, they avoid. They're afraid of dying, just like people. If we reflect on this, we see that all beings in the world, people as well, are the same in their various instincts. Thinking like this is called bhavana, meditation, development or cultivation. Seeing according to the truth. All beings are companions in birth, old age, sickness and death. Animals are the same as human beings, and human beings are the same as animals. If we really see things the way they are, our mind will give up attachment to them. Therefore it's said we must have sati. If we have sati, we will see the state of our own mind. Whatever we're thinking or feeling, we must know it. This knowing is called buddho, the Buddha, the one who knows. Who knows thoroughly, who knows clearly and completely. When the mind knows completely, we find the right practice. So the straight way to practice is to have mindfulness, sati. If you are without sati for five minutes, you're crazy for five minutes. Heedless for five minutes. Whenever you're lacking sati, you're crazy. So sati is essential. To have sati is to know yourself, to know the condition of your mind and your life. This is to have understanding and discernment, to listen to the Dhamma at all times. 
After leaving the teacher's discourse, you still hear the Dhamma, because the Dhamma is everywhere. So therefore, all of you, be sure to practice every day. Whether you are lazy or diligent, practice just the same. Practice of the Dhamma is not done by following your moods. If you practice following your moods, then it's not Dhamma. Don't discriminate between day and night. Whether the mind is peaceful or not, just practice. It's like a child who's learning to write. At first he doesn't write nicely, big long loops and squiggles. He writes like a child. After a while the writing improves through practice. Practicing the Dhamma is like this. At first you're awkward. Sometimes you're calm, sometimes not. You don't really know what's what. Some people get discouraged. Don't slacken off. You must persevere with the practice. Live with effort. Just like the schoolboy. As he gets older, he writes better and better. From writing badly, he grows to write beautifully. All because of the practice from childhood. Our practice is like this. Try to have recollection at all times. Standing, walking, sitting or reclining. When we perform our various duties smoothly and well, we feel peace of mind. When there is peace of mind in our work, it's easy to have peaceful meditation. They go hand in hand. So, make an effort. You should all make an effort to follow the practice. This is training. <laughs>